thank you for coming. Um, we're going to have a, a, a presentation of the graphic novel with, um, with Derek Ritter, um, RW94. Uh, we'll follow that with um, a panel discussion from four um, distinct scholars on the topic of Rwandan political violence um, in 1994. Um, and then um, we'll have a reception of some of the, some of the art from the, the graphic novel. And um, uh, we're actually selling some as well, if you, if you, care, to, if you care to purchase. Um, but we'll start with, um, we'll start with the uh, discussion of the, of the graphic novel. Um, and Derek and I will, will, will go back a little bit, um, back and forth between us as we're discussing kind of what's going on. Um, so the graphic novel is largely based um, on uh, my experiences in Rwanda first from 2000 to 2004. Um, between, during that time period, I was going to um, Rwanda about three to five times a year. Um, initially, I was brought out on a USAID project. Um, a, a former colleague of mine at the University of Maryland, Ernie Wilson, had some um, initiative where he was basically asked to kind of help um, raise up the IT for uh, Rwanda. And a bunch of different people were brought in at different levels to kind of do different things. And um, to have Ernie's version of it, um, they wanted some more black folk on the project. And he knew I was interested in conflict. And had, as they had just gone through a conflict period, he asked me if I was interested in going to Rwanda. And um, so um, uh, at that time, I was the only person in my family that had gone to Africa. So I was all up about going. And so I was ready to go. Um, of course, the African American connection with East Africa is a lot <laughs> is a lot less uh, concrete and well understood, and so it turns out there weren't many brothers and sisters there that were from um, um, that were from the states. Although the U.S. ambassador at the time was from a brother from Cleveland, and there's some other brother who was mysteriously I don't even know what he was connected with, but he was from Brooklyn. So we actually had um, a bunch of things that were going on, um, and then. Um, 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 Effectively, I engaged in a bunch of ethnographic work at the time. My immediate um, immersion, I was asked to go there to work with human rights organizations. It was quite vibrant, actually. Um, in 1999, 2000, there was a quite vibrant human rights community with a bunch of different civil society organizations. And I was giving this presentation at the US Embassy. Um, and um, the, I was to teach them on, on like human rights methodology. And my way of starting was, you know, I was very um, interested in understanding what people were working on. So I was like, OK, so let's introduce ourselves and let's talk about what we're working on. And I went first, and then we went around the room. And like the fourth or fifth person in, I realized just how fabulous um, their work had been, um, documenting um, different types of abuses and targeted against different types of people. And they collected exactly the type of stuff that we would have asked them to, kind of like who did what to when, where, why and in as much detail as possible and as, um, as sensitive and respectful manner as possible. And so very quickly I realized that um, it was quite an amazing group that I was in front of. But what was surprising to me was they were never in the room with one another. Um, so um, there was a group that studied just uh, victimization of um, kind of sexual violence and, and women. There was a group that dealt with a particular geographic location, but they didn't even go to the, the prefecture next to them. So it was a very... Um, momentous moment in many respects and then they all kind of wanted to interact with me dyadically and I was trying to interact with them as a group which I didn't quite figure out later on but I started collecting information from all of them um, and it was quite um, emotive an experience I think if anyone describes what kind of like going to Rwanda was like at the at the moment of that particular period um, and I couldn't quite process it all and so I tended to, to write in my journal a great deal about what was going on, and then I'd come back and I'd try to talk to people about it, and that didn't really work out that well because they didn't really have a basis for um, kind of understanding it. So I ended up not talking about it for years. Um, um, and then I was not exactly led to reflection um, immediately, but um, 2004, I get kicked out of the country for uh, a variety of purposes, or a variety of reasons, which um, we explicitly kind of address in. Um, the graphic novel, and then I kind of like, I'm like, well, who needs this? I'm like, I don't need this. So I left it alone and moved on to some other projects. And then I'm subsequently brought back to it, which is, I think, um, now kind of a general phenomena of sorts. Um, some of us dive in and we do some research on this particular topic. Some stuff happens, and we just kind of step away from it for a while. And then you kind of go back to it. And I was, I was kind of pulled back because of um, there was a UN report that talked about kind of RPF violence in, in Congo that I thought was quite um, fascinating. I think the, the, the second election in Rwanda was 
very disturbing in many ways, but the third one really was kind of like, I'm like, okay, it's going to be like that. You're just going to like be president for life type of thing. Okay, then I'm like, okay, maybe some of the things that I was on to, I need to go back to. And so then I came, I came back to Rwanda in a vengeance of sorts. So I have an academic book, a couple of academic articles, but that's a very limited audience, and I was trying to figure out some other vehicle for um, how I could hit a different audience. and also navigate around some of the things that exist with regards to Rwanda in terms of blockage. I knew of academics that had been blocked in terms of writing academic articles, similarly with books, but I never heard of anybody getting blocked for writing um, a graphic novel. And so when that particular opportunity came up, um, um, I moved to, um, to do it. And in many respects, um, was led to um, Derek, who um, um, I'm friends with um, his, his wife, Emily, and she was, we had a conversation, as you do at conferences, um, <coughs> discussing the kind of um, history and kind of getting to a point of frustration. I'm just like, yeah, you know, the academic thing's not quite moving in the direction that I wanted to because of the, the range of experiences that you could discuss. It's hard to get into ethnographic work in a, like a 25, 27 page format. And the stuff that I wanted to talk about was a combination of different things. And so we were looking for a vehicle for how to convey that, and she was like, um, you know, meet, meet, meet my husband. And, um, and then I got to Derek and then um, essentially delivered to him or handed him my, um, my compilation of um, uh, things that I had written. And then um, Derek kind of like jumped in and then yeah. I sent him a bunch of material. <laughs> yeah, and it was a lot. Um, <clears throat> For, it took me a long time just to at least feel competent enough across the material. I, uh, as I've said to some of you before, I didn't really know who I was going to meet. I had discussed with my wife previously, of course, that I'd been very much interested in illustrating, illuminating scientists' work. I'd lived with her for a while. I'd watched her career blossom and was really moved by her passion for her work in political science. science. Um, and this was sort of uh, the beginning of Chris and I's relationship. I mean, he gave me at least this many stories separate with their own kind of trajectory, um, not really wishing to take too much of a heavy hand in like where it should go. And I, he, I got a lot of free reign in terms of how to organize it. And this was the beginning of my thinking, you know, throw it up on a black, on a whiteboard and organizing immense complexity of Chris's experience, um, which took a while. <laughs> uh, there's What immediately started showing up was there was his personal experience, which we immediately realized were going to, inten going to end up becoming the travelogues that we are envisioning for his book of his personal experiences that we're hoping to personalize um, to make, help the science become more relatable more uh, touchable, um, more person to person, if we can, um, not overload people with data. There's um, the science, of course, the teaching sections that Chris wanted to relay to people, the, um, and the data itself. And then there was also this other side of it, the, uh, the testimonies of people's actual experiences. Chris had a wealth of documents that we wanted to intersperse with people that had actually been, who, who lived through the experience themselves. Because Chris and I, first Chris, I mean, he of course went there, he experienced Rwanda, and then it's getting re-filtered through me. We just wanted to be transparent about that whole process. And that's the essential thrust of the book, to help get it to you, to people who might be interested in the subject as uh, transparently as possible, but through art. Um, and that's whenever I did finally get through the full book, like with this, it was sort of a process to figure out, so how are we gonna do this? This is big. This could take a long time if we're really wanting to do this story. Tell your story, which is the story of how you studied Rwanda, studied that conflict, started from one idea about it and then led to another. I mean, that can take a while. Um, it began, of course, Chris being who he is, he wanted to get the whole book out like the 
immediately. <laughs> Which, of course, is like, I'm like, no, <laughs> I have to make it. And uh, eventually, it slowly moved back from full book to chapters to sections to finally, eventually now, with the 25th anniversary, it was, we just need to get the first story out. And so that's what we did. We made a classic uh, trade comic to at least initiate the thing. And as it rolls out, and this was something important to me, this story is going to affect us. Um, we've been pretty quiet about it. I haven't talked much about it to, my, to anybody because, as Chris was uh, quite forthright about, there, there could be some blowback or concerns. So it, we've been trying to handle it as de delicately as we can. But the benefits of finally now releasing it in the form that it is in the small uh, traditional comic fashion, there will be a certain level of development to the story, to its effect on us. Um, and once we got down to that first uh, package, the one that we have here, um, we isolated one story. And we ended up here at uh, Chris's experience coming upon a memorial. Um, it was one of the short stories that stood out. As soon as I read it, I'm like, this is the beginning of the book. This is where we're going to start. How are we going to create characters around that and, and uh, create um, a believable, relatable space? And that was the challenge. So, um, so initially, um, so I'm not crazy in the sense that um, we, um, the mapping out that we have of this is, is going to be 480 to like 500 pages in completion. Um, the idea for putting it out all at once was um, once it's out, then no one could try to block it. So that was our concern. So we just try to get the whole thing done, not talk about it until it's completed, and then release the whole thing so, so, it's, not, um, so it's not interfered with. And to clarify my, my lack of paranoia, at every point in time I've released anything on the Rwandan topic, I've been contacted by a bunch of people who were pleased about it and a bunch of people that weren't. But those folks also contact my, at every turn, my high school, the high school I graduated from, the college I graduated from, the graduate school that I went to, my employer, to all ask them how could, it, how could they have me there? And then they're forced to kind of come up with some kind of response as they're clarifying my particular position. Um, and so it was, um, it was quite interesting. But as we started to think through kind of like what's our first, what's our initial foray into this conversation, um, this particular piece um, stood out. It's one of the um, first ones that I wrote. Um, I wrote it in between like writing it and the first time that I kind of discussed it with anybody it was like five or six years. But um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a first description of going to um, one of these um, memorial sites. Um, we pulled up um, Mason Jenny, another colleague from Maryland and myself, like we did most places in Rwanda. Twist after twist, we went to the land of a thousand and one hills. Along the way, one saw faces, cows, some hacking of weeds, which kind of sent shivers down your spine. Someone sitting underneath the tree, and then without warning, the jungle parted, and you are shot out into some clearing. Before us, before us lay a flat area, but as always, we were surrounded by about 40 to 50 hills of different heights, inclines, and distances, dotted with little huts and revealing different agricultural plots. There's an amazing abundance of um, productivity within Rwanda. Getting out of the car and walking up to the first building, we saw something akin to Afro-industrial housing. Scrap metal ceilings, brick walls, old wooden doors with new metal locks provided by the UN. Except for the first building, the one we were approaching, all were lined up in three rows of four buildings, grouped in a square plot with a few scattered buildings at the periphery. Our guide told us that there was a memorial here honoring those killed by the genocide in 1994. This was why we were here, and after reading hundreds of testimonies, journal articles, and books, I eagerly approached to see, to feel, to record, to begin to understand. After walking closer, I saw a plaque on this site. 11,000 people were killed on April 11th. The magnitude of the killing was on the larger side of what took place during the 100 days associated with the genocide and civil war, and such a peaceful place could be associated with the murder of so many people, however, seemed unbelievable. At the plaque, we were approached by a man dressed in a, a brown long sleeve shirt, grayish pants, and no shoes. He limped toward us, and his body significantly contorted with the left side. Um, to keep his balance, his right arm kind of shot out at an angle, never quite in the same place. What came to mind was one of zombies, actually, the undead. You could see in horror films, slow, misshapen, edging forward by sheer force of will, 
Unlike movies, however, this character was very much alive. As the man came closer, our guide greeted him, and then we were introduced one at a time. His name was Innocent, a common Rwandan name. Innocent was very, well, very soft-spoken, and thus you had to lean in to hear him. Although he spoke Kenya Rwandan with almost no English, he talked directly to us, prompting me to pay attention like I understood what I was being said, almost as out of, just out of respect for his presence. Innocent's most noticeable feature after his soulful eyes and radiant if haphazard smile was the scar that moved from the top of his head around to the top of his throat. Seeing it, you just jump back inside thinking, wow, his head was almost chopped off. We were told that Innocent was one of the people who survived the killing here left for dead. He stayed in this place to show others what had happened. He stayed because he had no other place to go. After a second waiting for the translation to be completed, he looked at us one at a time, turned and walked to the first building next to where we were standing. We followed on shore. Our guide said he would wait for us by the entrance. There would be no need for words and thus his services. The three of us just looked at each other wondering if he had misspoken or if we had misheard or he was perfectly describing what we were about to experience. Innocent moved quickly, opening the door to the first building. As he turned the lock, he motioned for us to go in and moved on to other buildings. There's just nothing that describes the content of the room. Standing there, your senses are just overwhelmed. There were, no, there were rows of petrified white bodies, skeletons covered with lye, caught in what appears to be their last position in life, now death. It was like the pictures I had seen of victims of Pompeii, but you knew that this was recent and that unlike Pompeii, the earth here did not convulse and destroy the beings that lay before us. Rather, it was other humans that did this, some of whom were still in the vicinity. The positions of the bodies varied. Some were covering their heads. Some were gasping, jaws open. Some were bare, but still had little patches of black hair, little afros attached to their skulls. Alls were all were curled up in some way, into themselves and some into each other as if embracing. It was a sea of death contained in a room no larger than 10 by 10. Gazing at fingers, arms, heads, hips, feet, I became almost lost trying to ascertain when one body began and another one ended. After a while, I no longer tried. Still later, I remembered the breathe and inhale, but the stench of lye flooded your mouth, lungs, and soul. Set to vomit, I had to turn my eyes away, looking upward. There, serving as the black back wall and affixed somehow to the ceiling and the side walls, I saw a UN light tarp. As the tarp blew upward with the breeze, the bodies just lay there, unprotected open, telling in so many ways. At this moment, I just realized how many more rooms there were, actually, that we had not yet seen, and that I had not even moved from my first step into the room. Innocent could be seen busily moving from door to door, opening everything for us to see. After what felt like hours of this, we all walked back to the car, not nearly as spryly as we had arrived, not nearly as innocent or as young. I have not been innocent or young for quite some time, but I have Never been so thoroughly tainted and aged, I believe, in a single moment as that one. As we reached the exit, Innocent asked if we wanted to sign the book. Although numb and in some type of shock at the time, there was something about how he asked, something like a desire for acknowledgement and solace that moved me back from wherever I was. Of course, I said. And off he went to get it, and the three of us stood there awkwardly waiting his turn. Upon his getting back and seeing the book, I must admit it was not at all what I expected. Um, clearly, someone had spent a great deal of money on it. It was, not old, it was not old, small, or handmade. Rather, it was new, about 1,500 pages, and very well crafted. Turning the pages, looking for an empty one, the names and places were not limited and geographically concentrated. People came from all parts of the globe, seemingly, to this space. What individuals wrote washed over me is they were all similarly influenced by the place, somewhat taken aback. I could not think of anything to write but one word, and that was love, and then another one. I was then caught trying to figure out how to best capture what went through my mind at the moment, which was not a Bob Marley song or something that Richard Bach had scribbled. To do so would have been to seemingly trivialize the moment, or me as well as Innocent and the others. This was some cathartic experience, though, where my being called for some significant, some verbal monument, some marking, but I was unable to express anything. So I stepped away from the book as if it had offended me in some way in order to allow the others to write something that seemed to be more than willing and ready to kind of write something. Um, as tears rolled down my face, my mind moved back over the buildings, the bodies, and the smells. In the distance, I saw others beginning to approach where we were standing. The hills literally were coming alive. As I stepped back to the book, I did, not, I did the only thing that I could think of. I outlined my hand and wrote one love. Um, one reflection clearly of Marley and Bach, but it didn't seem to trivialize the moment. Rather, I think 
It was acknowledging the moment, and I was denying it. These individuals had touched me, given me a vocabulary of sorts to see and to sense. Um, when my being sought an expression to communicate, to commemorate, it made sense that it would bring them forward, these authors who had meant so much to me as a child. They were like the words in the drawn hand contained within me and printed. They remained, and now they would be remaining. As we turned to go, I saw the people from the surrounding hills getting closer and then closer. I must admit to having mixed feelings about this. On the one hand, I wanted to meet them. I wanted to ask them questions about what had happened here, what they had gone through, and what they had done. On the other hand, I was scared to death what their answers might be, what questions they might have in, directed towards me. But perhaps what troubled me the most was that there just appeared to be way too many machetes still lying on the ground. So. I sent that story to Derek, and then, yeah. <clears throat> so then I had to illuminate it. <laughs> it, it. It's beautiful. It was compact. It began and ended. Um, so I started drawing. <laughs> so what I'm going to show you here is just the first page's evolution. Um, Chris sent me that, that text, like directly. Um, we eventually learned that we needed to reinterpret um, that writing into a more <laughs> cinematic type of form. So we needed to start scripting at some point. But we didn't know that yet. I didn't know that yet. Um, I just knew that this story <coughs> needed to be illustrated. This story needed to be out there. Um, so. What I normally do is I start from a pretty literal twist after twist went the land of a thousand hills. I mean, it's one of the first lines of what he said. Um, now, this isn't all of my imagery, but pretty much it's rolling through the ideas and finding out how I want that first moment for the book to start. Um, maybe there's a little bit of something funny about before you've even seen the book, seeing behind the scenes stuff, but this is a, an, an image behind of like, how the process for me in my studio across the country, thinking about him experiencing this experience, it's, it's delicate. I don't, I didn't feel, I, I certainly felt at times that, you know, I was walking on holy ground, even though I, or at least I wanted to feel that as much as I could. Um, which, which just meant I went through a lot of ideas. I tried a lot of different things, a lot of different reorganizations of the textual material, um, constant conversations with Chris. Hey, man, does this work? Does this do what you thought? Am I doing the right thing? Do you have more images? Um, what am I doing wrong here? Um, the funny thing is he usually liked everything I gave him. <laughs> um, but there were some other uh, technical concerns related to this particular story. Um, eventually, we, we needed to insert some things, and I didn't get a slide up here for that, but like, we wanted to be, I, I've mentioned the term transparency, we, didn't, we wanted to be transparent about who we are. So we start this with Chris's experience, but on page two, which I'm not showing, I'm still just kind of rolling through page one's evolution, but as I, can, I go through this, I can just kind of talk about this. Um, but as we get into the comic, if, when you read it, uh, we introduce my character, even the path through which the conversation of even bringing me in, into the project, we just, we just roll that out there. Um, so his conversation with my wife, dude, I got a guy that can help you out. Um, me meeting him, and in, the, in this first story, we talk about the distances between us, um, the particular challenges involved with articulating this thing across such a distance, literally to him, literally across back in time to Rwanda. Um, I, we've taken some time to be as careful as we can for this first, first issue. Um, I'm not sure if y'all are catching stuff, but you, most of this is formal play. Um, a change of idea captures and seems to stick. You know, I kept playing with the textual material of that Pays de Milcolin phrase. It pops up in every book I'd read about it. It seemed like something that we cr have had to cross ourselves. It's what he mentions even in this story. Um, so sort of addressing and how to reinterpret that just seems to 
Just one second. So part of yeah. um, part of our confusion was I'd see an image and I think it's done because I thought it was beautiful, yeah, we great articulation. I'm just like, okay, we're done. Yeah. And then the next thing, I know there's an update on the Dropbox. I go to look at it, and he's done yet another version of it. I'm doing that less and less now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like I said, I, I wanted to be careful with this. You know, Once it's out, once it starts, the ball's rolling, and there's not really any going back. Um, so here we are. I think this is, no, that's not. That's not the final. I'm not sure if I got the final. Yeah, I didn't get the final of that image. It's in the book. Um, but, but yeah, we're here, and we have that first note of entering the country in printed form in our hands now, which was really, I actually held the comic for the first time yesterday, which you know, we've been working on it for a couple years now. So, um, so what is our general process? Our general process yeah. is, well, we, we talk a lot about what happened to you? We Skype across the, uh, the internets. We record everything, and we try to get it down into some sort of textual form um, for me to have him. So I don't have to have Chris right there ho sitting over my shoulder all the time. I mean, he's got a, he's got a job, right? He's got a full-time job doing something else. Um, somehow finding time for me to help give me the information I need to articulate his experience. Um, so we talk a lot. Right. <laughs> but part of the thing, part of the thing, you... part of the thing that became complex for me was um, so um, I, I wrote these stories in a, in a particular way in my journal, and I, it was one of those things where like I did not think I would be sharing them type of thing. This was for me to help me process mm -hmm. what was going on, to better yeah. ethnographically kind of like follow. Okay, who was I meeting? Who was I talking to? What what happened this particular day? And then some weird stuff would happen, and I'd still write that down, and they wouldn't even acknowledge that that's a story. But but in the way that I wrote it, I tried to. Um, because Rwanda is odd in the sense that you you could roll up into some particular geographic location, and you're sitting down to have some spaghetti bolognese, and somebody is also there, and you catch an accent, and you talk to them, and you're sitting down, and you don't know where this person came from. You just know that they happen to be in that same restaurant or same bar as yourself, and as outsiders, the Zungos, you're going to talk to one another and then just kind of chat. And so Derek would ask me some questions about like who was that person, and I'm like I don't know. But that's like that's that's Rwanda, and so there was a lot of there was a lot of that's Rwanda moments, and which I realized didn't work in yeah. order to actually draw a scene. It's like okay, that's great, but what did the room like? What yeah. looked like? What did the uh, literally? What did the floor look like? What was on the table? I, yeah, I got to ask that again. Yes, that's uh, every one of the, it's it's the little minutia of experience that you're not noticing or feeling, like being in this room, the things you're not paying attention to off on the side that make this a moment. And that's the stuff that I think about. Um, he worries about his memory. You know, what has your memory changed over time? And uh, I, I try to ask him those questions too. But um, And I try to find the best visual signal or sign that gets me into that room or that space or that conversation or that feeling as immediately as possible. That's the that's the panel to panel challenge for me. Um, but the reconstruction turns out to be interesting because um, I have the story and then I have like notes or I have like drawings that I took or pictures from the time. So getting back into that reconstruction is, is actually, um, um, and I then came across some notebooks that I had not looked at for like 10 or 15 years that I shared mm -hmm. with, with Derek, which was then fascinating because I'm like looking at my notes and trying to reconstruct what was going on. And then that became um, quite, quite fascinating. Um, in terms of the frequency, yeah. sorry, yes, I'm, oh, I was just going to say, I, you, you limited me on the image as a show, but I did put that in the box to like maybe yeah. show, but uh, Murumbai Mur uh, Memorial that we did illustrate in this story, like it was one of the uh, important drawings that I used to re reconstruct the image, because that's one of the things about that I'm noticing from the outside that's definitely come up in listening to lectures today, is just how over time, how quickly things can change, you know. I'm asking like, well, what did Morumbai look like? What was, what's, what sign was up at this time? Was it this many people or these people here? Did they, did they talk about Hutu deaths? Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a scholar, but I, I, I can tell that things are transitioning, can transition pretty quickly. And getting at that moment is a challenge, especially when there's not a lot of documentation. Oh, what, part of, part of, um, part of our difficulty was, um, 
Derek would try to get very precise about what something looked like, and then he would go and find these images of it. And I'm just like, well, when I was there, it wasn't like that. When I was there, it didn't have walls on the back. There was a tarp that was behind this thing. Um, and then we started to realize that the spaces, we were talking about this earlier, actually, um, the spaces fundamentally change, right? Um, they become, it becomes all more, much more institutionalized. All the um, memorials that I saw when I first went specified um, it's Semba Semba and it's Semba Boko, which represent distinct forms of political violence in Kenya Rwandan. One is uh, of an ethnic group and one is of those who are, are opposed or something like that. So it was identifying two distinct forms. Later on, I mean, by when I, like 2002, 2003, those have changed. It is now simply, it is just simply the, the decimation, the, the killing of those Tutsi. And so that fundamentally the, the message had changed in addition to the physical structure had changed. It had gone from being somewhat straw, placed together, kind of very um, varied conceptions. Actually, Jens's work captures a lot of these kind of like regular memorials, just people putting up their own. They weren't waiting for state sanction. They were, they were creating their own from local resources and so forth. So I'm immersed in that. And then the images are catching these later kind of like variations of it. And so we were kind of like, okay, what, which version are we trying to be truest to? And it was like, okay, let's get back to what it was as you were experiencing it and then kind of move from there acknowledging that it did shift. It did, it did move on. But um, problems with the process, pitfalls. Yeah. Pitfalls. Oh, do I get to answer all these, or do I get to ask you? Them? I'll chime. I'll chime in. Oh, you could. You could ask. Yeah. I, I'm going to ask you that. What? Do, yeah. Um. Because I'm curious. <laughs> uh, fair enough. We can, we can um, so I think. Um. I think. So. So literally, um, Derek did a version. Derek did a version of something, which. Um, um, it was an image of. Uh, I think I was in Butari at the time, um, and I'm sitting with some. I'm sitting with some um, other Mazungus, and I hadn't noticed the surrounding area. But across the street was um, um, the Made Niggas Hair Salon. And so I'm like, everyone else I was with was not black. I'll just put it that way. So I was kind of like, I'm like, what are these brothers doing? So I excuse myself. I go to the bathroom. And then I'm like, I'm making it away across the street. And I described this scene to Derek. And like the clearest, the clearest image, I think it was on this particular story, the clearest image was of a soldier holding a weapon. And the rest was kind of vague. And I thought that was a, a great characterization of my memory at the time. What stood out to me and what I remembered most was this particular soldier standing there and everything else was kind of like unclear. Um, it turns out that was just a version of what Derek was going to do and everything becomes more precise later on. And I wanted to roll the clock back. So, so um, part of the pitfall was that um, he doesn't necessarily know my writing process. I don't necessarily know his drawing process and artistically trying to kind of like match those things up. It's like, like when I want to stop him or when I think something's done and when he wants to stop is... Um, or why I want to stop. Or but I don't, I I don't know that that's a pitfall per se, but my expectations were, were off as we were kind of co-evolving as um, um, our experiences. And I think that was, that was something there. And Derek wants to be um, occasionally historically correct in a way that I'm just kind of like, nah, man. I'm like, that, that's... We're, we're, Historical accuracy is, it doesn't actually exist, so it's all, it's all perspective, not to get existential, but this whole issue of like, okay, everyone's got their own perspective. This, is, this, this, was, this one was mine, and let's kind of characterize that, and let's co-evolve to get to that spot. And he'd always push back, which is like extremely useful. He's just like, yeah, but what I'm seeing is on this, or I'm hearing this, and, and then I have to kind of justify my position in a way that then causes me to revisit that original material and those original thoughts. So, so that, that uh, yeah, okay, that's kind of part pitfall, but it's also good. Yeah, it's just like, it's like asking somebody on a resume, it's like, oh, tell me something bad about yourself. But, well, yeah. but yeah, and that's definitely pushed my, I mean, this, I come from a painting background, not an illustration or comic background. I, I am into, um, I don't know, Jackson Pollock's probably one of my favorite painters. Uh, get, getting in front of a big, um, surface and circling around it and doing performative work. I just didn't really like the whole gallery thing. Um, but comics became pretty important to me once I started envisioning what I could do with Emily. But that has definitely informed, like these conversations with Chris about accuracy, about truth, it's actually pushed me to re-bring back my painting roots. I mean, most, if you'll notice on the pages of the, of the comic, like I've I've got a canvas texture, you know. I've, I've left a lot of rough stuff, like 
as if it's always in transition because that's just a part of our conversations anyway. Something can always be edited one way or pushed or pulled one way or another. Um, I think that's one of the neater things about where we are stylistically at least. Um, that's definitely a good thing. Yeah, that's, yeah that's totally a good thing. Yeah. I mean, it's, but the point is we finally got there. Yeah. I think we got there. Like it took us a minute and it wasn't just like roughs finished to me, half finished drawings, you know, that may, may have gotten the job done, but that conversation still needed to occur and we needed to walk <coughs> that truth, that truthiness line. So how truthy, how truthful is this? Um, that needs to be clear for me, even if it means blurring it at the end of the day or smearing something out for an emotional pull or uh, symbolic um, emphasis. Script is up. Script is up. So yeah, this was one of the, so we did remains. We did the, the so the introduction, this uh, first comic has three sections or like three articulated sections in, a, in distinct forms that we've kind of edited together, spliced together. Um, but one of the things we learned after fooling around, I guess, is, oh, shit, yeah, we need to make a script and I need to get you to start thinking about camera angles and things like that and, and practicing that. So um, I've had, I had script uh, Chris write me this script, um, which was incredibly helpful for, you know, this quickified my art, my artwork. You know, I, I didn't make it so pretty. I didn't like, had to do so many trials and errors. This is a bit of a visual jump, and I pressed the wrong button. See, Sorry. he doesn't like that. That's I'm like, you don't. How do you not like that, man? I'm just like, he's like, well, oh, they, no, no. it can look different. Yeah, you know? whatever. I mean, but I'm like, that's still cool. Well, and it, it wasn't just that. It was actually how it played. Off. Okay, and I'll, I'll, I'm abbreviating, but like how it played off with what I'd already set up. You know, there needs to be some consistency. There needs to, as we move across these stylistic genres, which I've got a, an articulated variation of the style between each. Section so travelogue teaching and testimony. I wanted you to kind of feel that without there always being travelogue testimony. You know, I wanted to be stylistic, um, creative, interesting. But you know, this would lead to a much quicker articulation. Not that this stayed. This is not in the book. This we edited out because uh, one of the things that we were still working on is like, who the hell am I in the middle of all this? How do I get in and get out? Like, this is an image of me describing myself as an artist, which I used this submarine metaphor for a while, but it was just ultimately, I just thought too distracting and not, not took too much away from the actual experience that we were targeting. Um, yeah, so this is actually, now I'm gonna show just a couple of uh, previews of the next issue of what we're planning on getting into. So the first issue is actually zero, zero, just, yeah, to, be clear. just to be clear. Yeah, okay. But we're gonna we're gonna revisit or go back into Kigali um, with Chris's work, uh, and this is basically his pretty direct writing that that managed to stick pretty well. Top panel still can use some work. Um, sorry. Um, All good. But I, I I threw these two two panels in or these two pages in because it's a conversation that Chris had. Uh, about ethnicity. It was basically his experience <coughs> with eth ethnicity and how it's not talked about in Rwanda. And so I, we, I'm here articulating a conversation, how it just kind of comes up like, oh, shoot, it's illegal? What? <laughs> um, and yeah, I think it's just best to let you look and read and things like that. So um, uh, for, for most for most folks that are going to Rwanda, you, the, you have to go through Kigali, right? But, um, but I remember before I went, um, the, the late Allison DeForge, uh, Human Rights Watch activist, Allison was just like, if you want to understand Rwanda, get the, get the hell out of Kigali as soon as you can. That's, that's the key to understanding the place. And so p past Gateway, um, we, we then get out. But I remember one of the, among one of the first conversations, I'm just like, I'm like, um, I'm from, I'm unapologetically from New York. So. I show up, I'm in Rwanda, I'm just like, oh, you know, so where the brother's at? And then I'm like talking to some Hutu guys, which got me in trouble Im immediately because I didn't realize my hosts were, were Tutsi, which all ends up being problematic. And I'm just like, oh, so, so, so what was so-and-so? And it's like, oh, you can't say that. And I'm like, what do you mean you can't say that? He's like, oh, you know, we don't really reference ethnicity. I'm just like, 
but wasn't your whole conflict based on ethnicity? And just like, well, you know, we're trying to get past it. I'm just like, but the Tootsie are in power, aren't they? And so, like, literally, in like five minutes, I had offended like everybody by just being <laughs> explicit about all this stuff. And I'm just like, I'm so, so how do you talk about it then? And that conversation was someone hit me to this, like, okay, well, we have handbags and we have tea bags. And I was like, excuse me? And they're like, well, you know, the handbags are Hutu, the tea bags are Tootsie. And I'm like, oh, I get it, kind of. But then it was this interesting kind of ethnographic moment. I was just like trying to remember, trying to think about being African American, not talk about black and white. And um, it, was, it was quite interesting to kind of go from the conversation to then seeing the conversation, right? And so that's been, um, it's been, a, it's been an interesting revisitation because I'm, Rarely are you confronted back with your own life in a kind of objective sense as talked to, I mean, so it's very like therapeutic, right? So I have the life that I've lived and then I have Derek's conception of that life then pointing back to me to then get me to reflect on what it is that was stated, which is just weird, but. Um, yeah. And then this is, this is version. Yeah, I've done this like seven times. Um, yeah. this, this was actually a story I did first act, uh, to be quite frank that I, I, I changed just so that the style would match um, this first issue um, but yeah that'll come and then this is the last kind of teaser this is the um, conceptualized idea of how I'm wanting to articulate the testimonies of people people uh, Rwandan's actual experience I actually want to photo collage. Um, to me, I feel like I keep mentioning this holy ground thing, but it's like I can't touch it. The, these are people's words uh, written down in, um, in documents, a load of documents that Chris and I have gone through and read and selected and picked that um, will articulate certain points that we're trying to play off of and reflect. And I'm <coughs> handling them with care and trying to make them in a way that puts us there as, as best as we can in a creative way. Um, but like, as you can see, I'm replacing my drawings, my sketches with uh, um, images as close as I can to the, uh, uh, to the to Rwanda. Um, the top panel is pretty, pretty complete, but I'm probably gonna have to replace it because it's all stuff from <coughs> online things like that. <laughs> yeah, um, we, we could we talk about that. Yeah, we can talk about that. Um, so I think we'll stop there, but take some questions. So I, and this is the first question, so permit me to be slightly less articulate than I would have been in another five minutes. But I'm, I'm somehow trying to articulate what makes me deeply uncomfortable about the project. And here's why. Because you're doing all three things, seems to me to be different margins of error mm. or bounds of truth around all three of the different projects. So I completely buy the argument that your, or, or the articulation, that your recollection of your experiences is going to be somehow flawed. And we should expect your interpretation, your recollection, and how that then gets translated to Derek to have s some gray areas around it, right? And most comfortable by you actually saying, I don't expect this to be correct, right? I, I expect to get signs wrong, to get people's names wrong, to get, right, to, 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 to recall it differently, right, than it may have actually happened. But then you move on to, what, what's the middle T? So it's, it's teaching. Along, the teaching, right, which there's a lot less margin of error for, though somewhere in the middle, right? So that we have a recognized understanding of the narrative of the history in Rwanda mm -hmm. and, and certainly there and names and places and experiences matter and you have to get those right. All the way to the to the last, which is as close to a realistic articulation of somebody's testimony at the ICTR mm -hmm. as possible. So whether or not that testimony is flawed is a different question, but you have an actual written document that you're then trying to portray. And that's, in my mind, the closest to capital T truth. And so articulating to the audience where there is that error and where there isn't sounds really challenging. So I wonder what that is, whether that's like a postscript to, to the book or something, but saying, but we expect Christian stories to be, we allow Christian stories to be flawed. We don't expect. 
allow. See, I'm, I'll, I'll push back on the flawed thing, right? Because I'm, I'm, I'm writing, I'm writing down the ethnographic experiences yeah. almost in real time. So, like, the thing with the Maid Niggas Hair Salon, I wrote about it that night. So, like, I have that, I have that document, right? I don't think I gave you those, but it's just like, um, so like I have the original stories, and so I know when these things actually occurred. And but the images are going to be interpreted, right? Or no? I mean, like it, as much as a written document, yeah. right? But the thing I have to go off of is what I wrote at the time. So I'm just like, and from my perspective, it was irrelevant who I was sitting with in the restaurant. What's relevant is what happened when I went into the maid niggas hair salon. That was that was far more important. So I could I could care less about who those people were at the table because I never saw them again anyway. And I, frankly, I don't remember how we all ended up sitting together. I think someone heard me speak English and they decided that I was like friendly. I was like I was like, why are you sitting with me? But I guess that's my knee jerk reaction is like that's not what that table would have looked like, right? So my my knee jerk mm -hmm. reaction is not to challenge the story but to challenge the images. Who cares about the table though? It, it matters who I talk with. It matters who I talk with across the across the street. And what these brothers had to tell me, and then how they um, revealed to me what the Hutu male position was on all of this stuff, and how hip hip hop was our our connecting point. That for me was the most important element of that story. I could so so that's why you know so Derek wants to know how the table looks, and I'm just like, what you care about the table for, man? The landscape is shifting, and so yeah, capturing the physical landscape is an important. Part of that's why I wanted it vague. That's why, that's why I was less concerned with the precision of that particular table or street light, because I'm just like, what's that got to do with the conversation I had with these I brothers? Know, Derek, maybe Christian's right. Because that, I haven't, seen the, I haven't seen the first content, the first comment. I've only seen um, some of the page groups that were shared from early on. But that's, like, that's my first thing. It's like, ah, Miranda would have looked a little bit different, right? I, to me, this, this emphasizes the power of the image. Um, and we probably... I mean, we have slated in later chapters like this this very problem, this kind of uh, how do we know truth? How does this play on truth? I, to me, reading a book or reading, like we have this sort of prejudicial preference for written the written word as truth. And to me, I just don't, it's, it's, a, it's a mixture of symbols. I mean, moving from textual language to visual language is, is a gradated activity if your activity is especially comics. You know, I mean, we're mixing it in together because experience smears, you know, it just smears and we're all scraping for it. Hopefully we keep you in the story long enough to where, do we justify these issues? Do we say that we tell the truth better than somebody? I don't think so. I think we're just trying to capture an experience that at the very front end of it deals with what our memory is. I mean, that's a lot of what our, isn't this what today is a little bit about? What is the memory of what happened? I mean. And maybe that's the visceral reaction is that yeah. it challenges my memory, right? So like that's then yeah. my pushback. And I, I'm the power of images. I'm still trying to articulate. But I should have started with my cyan comment, which is a fascinating project. It's really, really exciting. <laughs> Um, so my name is Lisa the Cook, and I'm an economist. And I'm only saying this because I it would be helpful if people identify the approach that they're taking. Just so that I, I understand that you're somebody, and not sort of I told you the whole thing, but now I got it. You've seen things. You've seen things. Um, I was there, and I was there from 1989 to 2001, advising the government of that. And I had several moments like you're talking about. You just wind up in a restaurant talking to people and you have no idea where they are, you know, who they are, how they got there. And I'm having this discussion every weekend about how to prevent the next genocide. So, so there were many things that would come and go. So I, I appreciate your, your perspective in that sense because I wanted to hear from those people what they thought the origin of the genocide was. So that in my work, I could figure out how to prevent the next one. And if they even conceptualized that it was economic, rather than they talked to you about, about ethnicity, yeah. that how resources were distributed was definitely at the bottom of uh, what was going on. Certainly largely along ethnic lines, but not solely along ethnic lines. Back to this. If you could go back to the same, okay, this is exactly 
exactly what I was uh, looking for. Well, most of your conversations about ethnicity, these these people look like they're they're white besides you, are they? Um, at that place, yeah. Okay, so well, most of your conversations about ethnicity. So the one you told was about attending um, Houthis and Tutsis, which I did on a daily basis <laughs> as well. Um, were those kind so I didn't have so many conversations. I heard a lot from the people I was surrounded by, uh, and the people on the the IMF team that I was on were were both the Houthis and Tutsis. And they didn't talk about it, but there was a lot going on in the background. The people I talked about this with were the white people I was interacting with who were from all over the world, um, from America, who were in the restaurants, for example. So is this, is this articulating your experience, or is this projecting your experience? What, what's going on here? This is articulating part of it. So my, my initial my initial visitations um, were quite frankly with the, U the other USAID people that I was there with. Um, it's not until I break away from them that I then start to have a completely different interaction because I'm interacting with a bunch of um, first young Hutu, young, young Tutsi men, and then young Hutu men, which I, I didn't even make the distinction yet. So this one brother was driving me around a lot, and I hadn't quite figured out that, oh, like, you know, if you're the cab driver, if you're the cab driver that's sitting outside the Mill Colleen, that's a great deal. That's a fantastic deal. So it didn't occur to me how he got his cab, who his connection was, how, how cool he was in terms of his other connections. And then I started looking at where they were driving me and where they were taking me and what part of the city I was missing. So then I'll just be like, no, I'm good. I'm not feeling well. And then I'm going over to go explore these locations. And I end up in these spots where a bunch of young Hutu males are, are kind of hanging out. And evidently, it's very, it's very clear, they were saying, it's very clear that I was not from there. And then they're just like, yo, you know, where are you from, brother? And I'm just like, I'm like, I'm, I'm from New York. Conversation. Next thing you know, I'm in a room, there's 20 of them we're sitting down, and they're asking me all, the, all these types of questions. So that, that's a very different type of conversation. Um, but then the, like, the all black conversations I'm having there are very different from like these. Um, and so we go there as well. But this is like, um, the book is roughly chronological in the sense of initial immersion, but there is some, there is some movement around in terms of like Pulp Fiction-y. There, there is some movement around of this thing actually chronologically happened first, but we wanted to lead with this particular thing. And so we do get to those conversations. And, um, and then once conversations start to become, because um, we do surveys there, we're doing focus groups, we're doing, I'm working with the, the, uh, the Center for Conflict Management at the University of, um, um, in Butari. Um, and so um, a, lo a lot of immersion there. And then at that point, interestingly enough, a lot of my white, I, I, they're gone. And it's just kind of like me with a bunch of um, young Tutsi youth and, and some other kind of academics, mostly at the university for a while. And so that the composition of the people I'm interacting with changes and the conversations and the information I'm getting access to. Yeah. So I have just a quick follow-up yeah. question. One thing that I noticed about being among the Houthis and Tutsis who were not talking, once again, uh, they weren't talking in a public space. But as soon as we exited that public space, there was this pull to try to say, or to ask, which side did you yeah. been on? Yeah. And you would have been, I mean, everybody kept telling me, and there was this whole sort of pull about whose side you would have been on. Yeah. You know, would you have tried to identify as a Hutu or in the genocide, or would you have um, let your, your features speak for themselves and identified as a Tutsi? Did you get that? Um, so I wrote a story. Um, it's, not, it's not in the, the book, but basically it was about, um, it's called uh, Researching While Black. And so I referenced the whole thing about um, how I, I can think of only a few contexts where being a young black male, young-ish black male, um, um, helps you out. And if one is trying to reach the aggrieved or the upset or the politically pissed off, being a, being a black male helps tremendously. So it was one of those situations where, um, so while in India, the association with King and the civil rights movement is like, kind of like your gateway drug to understanding the Dalit condition and their willingness to speak to you, in the Rwandan context, it was like if they were if they were young black and male. It was like it was a Tupac moment. It's like it was like I was a brother magnet. They just come up asking me questions, and so um, that was less. 
there was an automatic assumption that as a, as a black male, I was clearly um, anti-American. I was clearly going to be down with the revolution, whichever revolution it was. Whether or not it was the Tutsi revolution or the Hutu revolution, they just thought that I, I would be down for whatever struggle. And so um, once I was able to break away from the kind of like young um, Tutsi um, uh, affiliation and interaction to kind of interact with some young Hutu males, it was like, um, first we go through the gateways, like, you know, asking me questions about, it's like the Source Magazine quiz, quizzes. I'm just like, it was like a, a hip hop uh, a thought, authentication system for a while. And then like, um, and then once we got past that, then we get to be like, yo, so what's on the radio? Because I noticed that a bunch of people still listen to the radio in the back of anything that I was going to. And, you know, you could listen to Farrakhan for five minutes and you might not know what's exactly being stated, but you could tell there's some visceral kind of dynamic going on. I'm just like, what you brothers listening to in the back? And they'd be like, All right, we'll tell you about that later, brother. And so that just became quite interesting. But I, um, it made me reflect about, um, it, um, it, made you, it made me reflect upon the, the whole, um, there's a literature um, on positionality how your how the person that you're speaking with is is pr making judgments about what your identity is and thus what they can speak to you about the presumptions about what my identity was as an African American male um, as to as to how that immediately aligned me with them politically I was fascinated by that now I might not be able to get to the elite in like the UK or something like that but you stick me in some you stick me in some African nation I'll, I will find some young brothers who are ready to talk to me about some like revolution and struggle stuff and that was fascinating for me because it worked on both it worked on both sides um, but a similar dynamic you had public speak and then you had off in a corner with some banana beer conversation with um, so and then and then some gender dynamics as well right so it was uh, it was quite it was quite interesting so I'm like I definitely don't think that I, I was like privy to all conversations but then I'm kind of like that's why I think we needed to have research teams that are comprised of everybody, right? Like there's some, there was, there, was a, there was a young Asian component. If you were a young Asian female, you would have got access to certain people that I wasn't getting access to. And I'm just like, we needed a research team of everybody to basically be like, okay, you talk to them, you talk to them, we'll, we'll converse later to figure out exactly what we could not get to. And then we mix it up to kind of like figure out what was going on. But I didn't figure that out until like much later. But sorry, long, long answer. Other questions? Oh, sorry. Yeah, can, you, can you say a little bit more about writing yourself into the comic, actually? Um, like, what, when you're thinking about telling stories, you know, I take it that part of you want to know what would, would happen in the line. Mm -hmm. So, like, one of the things that was striking was your description of Innocent. Like, I kind of want to know more about Innocent, like yeah. who that was mm -hmm. and what was his experience. Yeah. So, one choice you could have made was to find characters like that, get what you could about him, to weave a narrative yeah. about what happened, maybe thinking yeah. about different perspectives. And I wonder if, <coughs> if that can be done effectively, or if that's something that you were concerned to do you know, while having yourself be part of that, in some sense, right? Mm. About saying more about yeah. Like, what, what, uh, so I, guess I, I, I guess my uh, your, your place in this attempt to try to come to terms with what happened. Yeah. Share this with us in this form. <laughs> yeah. So I think I was influenced by a couple of things in terms of thinking about it. Um, we just kind of dove in with that as um, okay. That's hey, we're just gonna we're gonna do this um, and then kind of proceeded with it. Um, so I was very much taken with kind of Spiegelman and Maus as it's a, a conversation between he and his father and his father's recollections. So, um, um, so the, the art Spiegelman is clearly in the story as he's trying to tell his father's story, but it's also about between between the two of them. And so, I very much thought that was interesting. In March, it's John Lewis's story, right? So it makes sense that John Lewis would be in it. So I was very much kind of taken by that. And also Sacco, um, Joe Sacco is is quite present in his thing as well. Um, but in this kind of like, um, there was two things I was concerned with. One, I did not wish to presume to speak for innocent, so I didn't want to kind of go there. And then it seemed as if my, like the Heisenberg principle, right? Like it seemed as if my ability to access a thing was in part a function of my presence and my interaction with that thing or those people, and so I wanted to be as transparent with that kind of dynamic as possible. And and I'm quite clear on like when I think someone responded to me in a very racial manner, like that the 
I, I think I benefited tremendously that the U.S. ambassador at the time was an African American. There's no way that that hurt me. That brother was just like, walked around a room. Now, it's like, you know, our names send signals and shit. So, right, excuse me. So, but he was like, um, but he was kind of like, oh, you know, I didn't know you. He literally, the first words out of his mouth, I didn't know you were a brother. Shakes my hand, takes me to a corner. He's just like, you let me know anything I can help you with while you're here. And then he goes off to be like ambassadorial in, in our conversations and stuff. But I'm like, but I remember that interaction. And so as, as it relates to my ability to tell any story or what it is that I end up getting involved in, I think it's so intricately connected with my identity that I wanted to be as clear about that as possible. In part to kind of get to the whole, um, quite frankly, those of us that do kind of quantitative work don't acknowledge exactly how the in-person ethnographic stuff influences what went on. But I know that people handed me data. They handed me data and or turned something on and walked away from a panel while handing me a CD-ROM or handing me a, U a USB. Be like, uh, you know, I'm going over here. I know that that was uh, directly related to how we were connecting or how they thought we were connecting because of our identity. So I kind of wanted to be um, conscious about that. But also, I'm just like, I have no idea what the hell Innocent had gone through. So all I have is kind of what he was willing to talk to me about at that time or what I can piece together from the different pieces of evidence that I had. So I was just trying to be, um, I guess, as, as honest with the experience and not try to speak about, um, or, or rather, I didn't want to speak to, I wanted to speak with, and I thought I had to be co-present to do that. I also pushed him to put himself in there. I kind of wanted, a, part of my background interest here is I'm interested in people being involved in science, involved in the arts, following through with their career paths and um, pursuing knowledge as, as uh, as, uh, as fully as they possibly can. Um, to me, I, it's a way to create a story that's believable and relatable if he puts himself out there. So I suggested it pretty early on. And Chris is also like, he's the consistent character through all the, through the data dump that he gave me um, in terms of remembering, like, there, there's only so many characters that return throughout this long book. So somebody needs to kind of be a focal point in terms of, at least from my vantage, in dealing with how to make it a story. Is like, you have to be in this, and we need to experience how you got this information, A, because it's interesting, and B, uh, no, I think it's just A, because <laughs> it's just interesting. It's interesting to me, because that's, that's what helps me uh, lift up and follow through the data um, and the science. It's difficult for me at times. You know, you want that, per to me, I want that personability um, as a reader. And I also like read, read, read Mouse and, and The other thing that. you want from readability, though, is you want to yeah. give us a sense that the character is going through something, yeah. that, that there are challenges, there are, right. there are conflicts. There are, yeah. Right, so how does that play in to writing Chris in when he's the source of the, like, the information that is giving you the basis for the story? Like what? What are his conflicts? What are his challenges? Right? How do we how do we see that develop in the in the in the novel? Yeah, you get those two, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, I, that do that comes out. Yeah, I mean, that's unfortunate, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's like it doesn't it, all come it, out. Wasn't fun to live through, but yeah, I mean, necessarily, I'm, I'm trying to be as, uh, I mean, clearly, the the remains remaining story. There's clearly some like. Um, PTSD coming off of that one. I'm like, I had not been around that many dead bodies, you know. Um, the smell of lie, I still remember, and some like um, kind of like sense on the interior of my memory. And so it's like, even, I mean, I don't even know how I, we're going like back 18 years. Um, I smell it right now. You hear my voice. I mean, like it wasn't raspy a second ago. So it's like I'm literally like right there um, to get there. But then I think we we do go through those. But part of it is an issue of um, um, the ethnographic experience with interacting with the people. But then it's also about this whole issue of trying to tell a story about what has happened to a group of people in a particular location in a contested site where they're dealing with trauma and violence and recovery and political machinations to try to establish a dominant narrative and so forth. Um, and so it's about 
you with villagers. It's, you, it's about you and innocent, and there are many innocents, right? Um, it's about you and other academics. It's about you and your family, and we kind of go there um, through a bunch of that. And then us trying to negoti negotiate things as well, because he'll push back on something, and I'll like push back on him with it. And so, and we're, and all of that's in there. So it's like uh, we didn't actually hold back too much with regards to those kind of internal dynamics and tensions and so forth. So, uh, one last one. Yep. Question about the, the audience you're speaking to. And I hear different sections here, different moments, processing sort of field work almost. I mean, I'm a researcher, so that's how I read this. And I think there's really real value in that. I think in the academic community, there can be a real interest in people who've done field work just kind of seeing someone else process their experience. You also have this section. Real good question. Um, so um, my thing is, I think that's one of the reasons why we start off with um, the ethnographic components and don't go to the casualty estimation stuff, right? It's like um, one of the things I end up trying to do while there is trying to figure out literally this casualty count in space and time, which gets to be quite sophisticated, right, as you're going through multiple systems estimation. We do a bunch of, and we try a bunch of different techniques. Um, and so we're not jumping into that because who the heck would care about that? But you care about it because of this kind of ethnographic development and kind of like character associations and, and the different people that you're kind of interacting with. Um, and so I, I think part of the buy-in is, um, I mean, so what got me with Sacco in Palestine is um, his slightly snarky, very kind of open sense of like, I want to tell a great comic and I want people to buy them. He like tells you that in the first like five pages. And so then you're just like, okay, not exactly the motivation I was looking for or expecting. And then he tells you this incredibly impassioned story. And you're just like, oh, uh, all right, I might not like you necessarily, but okay, you're gonna, you're gonna navigate a whole bunch of interesting space. And so hopefully there's some kind of um, connection that you have. And hopefully actually it is that lack of, I mean, I, I don't mind that if, if people that have actually had some experience with Rwanda look at it and they kind of and delve into it and see something that's cool. But I, I really hope that it's really something that folks that have no connection with it at all are kind of like, oh, well, what would I be, what would I be like if I went? And I think in many respects, it's kind of the same thing. I was surprised to be like, I mean, in the States, you'd like, we talk about black and white people like every other day. I mean, the idea of going to a location and be like, can't, can't talk about that, it's illegal. I mean, I think we would go through similar types of dynamics. So I think there, despite the fact that, um, despite the fact that it's, it's me and it's Africa and all this other business, I think there's some elements of the story that will resonate. And we're actually hoping that it's the different parts of it that will draw the broader audience, because you could have just have the ethnographic version and not the teaching stuff, or have the testimonials, but not the, I mean, so there's the different points. And they, I think they do reinforce one another in a particular way, because you're just like, well, who the hell are these people? And we're like, okay, well, let's stop everything. Let's talk about who that person is. And actually, there's different perspectives that you get on that. And so what's kind of cool is we get to call some people out, too. So um, there'll be some people that are in the, the graphic novel who have actually written on the topic who are our, our colleagues in the profession, right? So I'm just like, all cards on the table type of thing. But, um, but hopefully, um, that will be something that you all are, are finding of interest. In, of interest. Um, we will have the, um, we'll transition to, um, to the, uh, the round table. And then there'll be um, kind of a reception display on the fifth floor, um, like one floor up. Um, so let's transition um, and then start in two minutes. Thank you. Thank you.